If you can't see why this ECG is diagnostic of an acute LED occlusion, then you should definitely watch the rest of this video. Welcome back to Practical ECG Courses. It's Obeid once again. Many clinicians are not aware that over the past few years, the way ischemic ECGs are interpreted has significantly changed. So much so that the STEMI and STEMI paradigm is already outdated and a new paradigm has come up in its place, and that is the OMI NOMI paradigm. So today, I'm going to give you a quick update on the battle of the paradigms, STEMI and STEMI versus OMI NOMI. Acute coronary syndrome occurs when there is a sudden occlusion of the coronary arteries resulting in myocardial ischemia or infarction. Clinically, this manifests in three ways, STEMI, NSTEMI, and unstable angina. To understand the STEMI and STEMI paradigm, you must have a clear understanding of the pathophysiology of ACS. ACS is essentially a condition where there is a demand supply mismatch of oxygen to the myocardium. When an atherosclerotic plaque suddenly ruptures, a thrombus is formed. If the thrombus is big and totally occludes the artery, the entire myocardium dies and you have a transmural infarct. On ECG, this is represented as an ST segment elevation. If the thrombus is small and only partially occludes the artery, the subendocardial region gets affected as it has the highest metabolic rates. On ECG, this is represented as an ST segment depression. If the partial occlusion is significant enough to cause infarction, then there is a release of troponins and this is referred to as NSTEMI. If the partial occlusion only causes ischemia but not infarction, then troponins are not released and this is referred to as unstable angina. Why does STEMI terrify us? Why are we more relaxed when it comes to an NSTEMI? This is because traditionally STEMI is used as a surrogate for a total occlusion of the coronary arteries and therefore this is a patient who needs to be taken to the cath lab and revascularized right now. In contrast, NSTEMI is traditionally considered to be suggestive of a partial occlusion which means that the patient does not need the cath lab activation right now. In the UK, as per NICE guidelines, STEMI gets the cath lab within 2 hours, whereas NSTEMI gets the cath lab only within 72 hours. So what is the primary purpose of the STEMI and STEMI paradigm? It is to help identify patients who have an acute coronary occlusion and therefore needs immediate revascularization. A STEMI indicates total occlusion and therefore gets immediate cath lab activation, whereas an NSTEMI indicates partial occlusion and therefore gets a delayed cath lab activation. Which brings us to the question, is the STEMI and STEMI paradigm reliably differentiating total occlusions from partial occlusions? Now this is where things start getting interesting. In 2017, Khan et al. published a meta-analysis involving seven studies and 40,000 NSTEMI patients who received a delayed cath lab activation with a mean time to angiography of over 24 hours. 25% of these NSTEMI patients were found to have a total occlusion of the culprit artery. Not just that, it was found that the NSTEMI patients with the totally occluded culprit arteries had higher biomarkers, worse LV dysfunction, and higher mortality as well. Obviously, this makes sense, doesn't it? If a patient with a totally occluded coronary artery was taken up to the cath lab only after 24 hours, then it is logical to assume that the patient would have a larger area of infarct, and this means higher biomarkers, worse LV dysfunction, and higher mortality. In addition, even though the NSTEMI patients with total occlusion were on average younger and healthier than those with partial occlusion, the NSTEMI patients with a total occlusion had doubled the mortality as compared to those with a partial occlusion. The fact that some NSTEMI patients actually have a total occlusion on delayed angiograms is not new. There is a body of literature from as early as 2001 that has consistently shown this. It is important to note that none of these seven studies were part of the meta-analysis that was done by Khan et al. The take home point here is that 25 to 30 percent of NSTEMI patients actually have totally occluded culprit arteries. Is the STEMI NSTEMI paradigm failing us? It is obviously misclassifying a significant percentage of total occlusions, and so it is failing in its primary purpose, which is to reliably tell us which patient needs the cath lab now. I'm sure you have all heard of the term STEMI equivalence. STEMI equivalents are ECG patterns which do not fulfill the STEMI criteria but are suggestive of significant occlusion and have to be taken to the cath lab now.
the very existence of the term STEMI equivalence tells us that STEMI is not picking up all the total occlusions. This list keeps growing as we keep finding more and more patterns which are indicative of an acute coronary occlusion. Why is the STEMI and STEMI paradigm failing us? It is because there are some fundamental flaws with this paradigm. The STEMI criteria is a millimeter based criteria. How can anything in biology be arbitrarily defined in terms of millimeters? Suppose Tom comes to the ED with chest pain and his ECG shows 1 millimeter of ST elevation in lead 1 and AVL. He gets diagnosed as a STEMI and is taken to the cath lab within 2 hours. Now somewhere in the multiverse on another earth where the STEMI and STEMI paradigm is still applicable, another Tom goes to the ED with the same chest pain, only this time his ECG is taken a few minutes earlier, so his ECG shows 1 millimeter of ST elevation in lead 1 but only 0.9 millimeter of ST elevation in AVL. Now he gets diagnosed as an NSTEMI and is taken to the cath lab sometime within the next 3 days. Can you see the problem here? Anything that does not fulfill the STEMI criteria automatically gets diagnosed as an NSTEMI and then gets an entirely different treatment pathway. The very name ST elevation MI makes us think that ST elevation is all that matters. Think about it. When we look at an ECG, where do our eyes automatically go to first? For most of us, it is the ST segment. And if you look at an ECG which has been signed off, most of the time it says normal sinus rhythm, no ST segment changes. This is because we have been brainwashed into thinking that ST segment is the most important part of the ECG. But it's not. If you think logically about a myocardium undergoing infarction, the infarction will affect both the ventricular depolarization as well as repolarization. On ECG, this will manifest as changes in QRS, ST segment and T waves. Then why do we only use the ST segment elevation to decide when the patient is going to be reperfused? It makes no sense. The ST segment elevation is only one of the markers of acute coronary occlusion. We should be looking for others as well to decide which patient needs the cath lab now. The STEMI and STEMI paradigm makes us think of STEMI and NSTEMI as two distinct pathologies where STEMI has a fixed total occlusion and NSTEMI has a fixed partial occlusion. But in reality, acute coronary occlusion is a complex and dynamic process. The thrombi are not static, they propagate and lies constantly. So anything that partially occludes can also totally occlude. The ECG changes in acute coronary occlusion are an intricate and time sensitive progression of changes, exquisitely sensitive to reperfusion and reocclusion. If not the STEMI and STEMI paradigm, then what? This is where the OMI NOMI paradigm comes in. OMI stands for occlusion MI and NOMI stands for non occlusion MI. This was proposed by Dr. Stephen Smith and colleagues in 2018. Dr. Smith is an emergency physician who is one of the brightest minds of our generation when it comes to ECGs. You may already be familiar with him. He is the one who modified the Scarposa criteria, which is now known as the Smith Modified Scarposa criteria. He has a blog called Dr. Smith's ECG blog where he shares his cutting edge research and insights into ECG interpretation. This entire talk is based on his blog and his teaching. I would strongly recommend going through his blogs. If you want to learn the OMI NOMI paradigm, then Dr. Smith's ECG blog is the best and the original resource. A disclaimer here. This is not one of my usual talks where I will be focusing on interpreting ECGs. Of course, I will show you how to interpret the ECG shown at the beginning of this video. But otherwise, this is not a technical talk. I have two very specific aims for this video. The first is to introduce the OMI NOMI paradigm to the maximum number of clinicians and then to show how subtle ACS can be diagnosed on an ECG. The concepts behind the OMI NOMI paradigm have been around for at least 15 to 20 years and the name OMI NOMI has officially been around since 2018. Yet a lot of practicing clinicians are unaware of how drastically the interpretation of ischemic ECGs has changed over the last few years. OMI NOMI is going to be the biggest change in practice when it comes to ECG interpretation that we will see in the coming decade if not in our lifetimes. 10 to 15 years from now, OMI NOMI will be the standard practice because it makes sense and the evidence base for it is rapidly growing. More and more literature is coming out every year in support of this. I hope this video serves as a primer for OMI NOMI.
I hope it inspires you to learn more about subtle ACS and start implementing it in your practice now rather than along with the rest of the world 10 to 15 years from now. This is where we are now and this is where we need to be in the shortest possible time frame. Imagine how much myocardium you can save and how many lives you can change for the better in those 10 to 15 years. Our patients deserve the best care we can offer. One way you can help achieve this goal is by sharing this video with all your colleagues. Because for this to succeed, all of us of all grades and all specialities will need to unlearn and relearn how to interpret ischemic ECGs. So please share this video freely. Because I want to keep this video as short as possible, I will not be discussing everything about OMINOMI. I will just introduce the concept and focus on one aspect of how we can pick up OMI. OMI is defined as acute coronary occlusion or near occlusion with insufficient collateral circulation such that the downstream myocardium is at risk of irreversible infarction without immediate reperfusion. In contrast, NOMI does not have a total or near total occlusion or there is sufficient collateral circulation which will prevent an active infarction and so NOMI patients do not need to be taken to the cath lab immediately. As you can see, the OMI-NOMI paradigm focuses on occlusion, which is what we are actually looking for when we interpret an ECG in a patient with chest pain. It also takes away the misconception that ST elevation is what matters. There is no single criterion for OMI and the clinical context is an important factor. There are a number of ECG patterns which can represent OMI. We are already familiar with a few of these, like Scarbosa criteria in LBBB, D Winters T wave, etc. Even an unambiguous STEMI comes under the OMI classification because it represents a total occlusion. I hope you have understood what we are trying to do with the OMI NOMI paradigm. We are casting the net wide enough so that we can catch all the total occlusions and not just those that fulfill the STEMI criteria. This way, every total occlusion gets an appropriate cath lab activation immediately. The most important principle in the OMI NOMI paradigm is proportionality. The ST segment and the T wave are only large or small relative to the QRS. The absolute height does not matter much. The entire list of the literature for the OMI NOMI paradigm is there on Dr. Smith's ECG blog. These are some of them. How can I diagnose an acute coronary occlusion before the ST elevates? Let's see if we can answer that today. This image shows the evolution of ECG changes in an acute MI. First you have the hyperacute T waves, then the ST elevation, pathological Q waves, T wave inversion, and finally an upright T wave. If you want to diagnose an acute coronary occlusion before the ST elevates, then the obvious answer is to look for hyperacute T waves. The 2022 ACC guidelines which was released less than a year ago now formally recognizes hyperacute T waves as a STEMI equivalent. This is the ECG of a 50 year old male with chest pain. The ECG does not fulfill the STEMI criteria but it is diagnostic of an acute LED occlusion. Why is it so? Look at the T waves. Does any of it look hyperacute? We are traditionally taught that hyperacute T waves are tall T waves. In reality, hyperacute T waves should be defined in relation to the height of the preceding R wave. So, V2, V3 and V4 seems to be big T waves. Let's look at V4 first. Does it look like a hyperacute T wave to you? If it doesn't, then compare it with what a normal T wave should look like in V4. When you analyze a T wave, focus on two aspects of the T wave. First is the characteristics of the T wave itself. Look at the size of the T wave, especially the apex and the base, and then look at the area under the curve. Here, you can see that the size of the T wave is small with a narrow apex and a narrow base. The area under the curve is also small. In comparison, if you look at the T wave here, both the apex and the base is wider, and the T wave looks bulkier than the normal T wave. Also, the area under the curve is significantly more than that of the normal T wave. The second thing you need to look at is how does the T wave look in comparison to the R wave. In the normal ECG, you can see that the T wave is so small compared to the height of the corresponding R wave. Whereas in this ECG, the T wave clearly towers over the R wave. Now look at V3. You should be able to appreciate why this is a hyperacute T wave. 
It is bigger and bulkier than normal with a larger area under the curve and it is towering over the preceding R wave. Similarly, V2 is also a hyperacute T wave. In fact, even V5 may be a hyperacute T wave or at least it is on its way to becoming one. What are the other findings on the CCG? There is a poor R wave progression here. The R wave in V3 and V4 is smaller in comparison to the R wave in V2. This is again suggestive of ischemia. In lead 3 and AVF, there are down up T waves. These are biphasic T waves which are initially negative and then become positive before returning to the baseline. Down up T waves are supposed to be quite specific for ischemia and are one of the many subtle signs of ischemia. There is also a loss of precordial T wave balance on this ECG. Normally, the T wave in V1 should always be smaller than the T wave in V6. This is referred to as a precordial T wave balance. Now, if a patient with chest pain has a new tall T wave in V1, which is larger than the T wave in V6, this is referred to as a loss of precordial T wave balance. In conjunction with the other findings, this is again suggestive of ischemia. To summarize, there are hyperacute T waves in V2 to V5, which on its own is considered a STEMI equivalent. In addition, you also have poor progression of R waves, down up T waves in lead 3 and AVF, and loss of precordial T wave balance. When you consider all these subtle signs together, then the logical conclusion is that it has to be an acute LAD occlusion. Now, what actually happened with this patient? This ECG was interpreted as normal by both the emergency physician as well as by the cardiologist and the initial troponin taken along with the CCG was also normal. So everybody was relaxed as this was not a STEMI and the patient was asked to sit in the waiting room. It was four hours later when his second set of troponins came back sky high that a second ECG was done. And this is the repeat ECG. As you can see now, he has a full blown anterolateral STEMI while he was sat in the waiting room. There is no R waves left in V2 to V6. It's all QS waves which means that his entire anterior wall infarcted. He was then taken to the cath lab where an angiogram revealed an acute LAD occlusion. At time of discharge, he had an ejection fraction of around 40%. There are a few learning points in this case. The important ones are, learn to identify hyperacute T waves. It is now formally a STEMI equivalent. If you have any doubts, compare with the old ECG. Repeat ECGs at frequent intervals. Look for other subtle signs of ischemia. When hyperacute T waves are seen on an ECG, the troponins may be normal as it is too early in the disease process. Learn the ECG findings of subtle ACS. There's a lot more to learn about OMI, NOMI and subtle ACS. Hyperacute T waves is just the beginning. I have not mentioned anything else as I wanted to keep this video short. The best resource for this is without doubt Dr. Smith's ECG blog. It is the original resource for all this. Everything you need is on there. Earlier this year, I conducted an ECG workshop on subtle ACS exclusively for higher specialty trainees and consultants. Since then, I have been invited to teach at different places and so I ended up doing quite a few sessions on subtle ACS, including regional training days and registrar teaching at different trusts. So I know for a fact that there are a lot of clinicians out there who are not familiar with all this and would like to learn this in more detail. If people are interested, it makes sense to do another full day ECG workshop on subtle ACS for senior clinicians. Let me know what you think. As always, if you want to be informed about my ECG teaching sessions, fill out the form on this QR code and I will let you know when I am doing my next session. I will leave the link in the description box below. Let's play the sandwich game with this ECG. I am not going to tell you the answer in this video. Analyze the ECG and then decide what you are going to offer this patient. Do you offer him a sandwich and then send him home or do you offer him a trip to the cath lab? You need to tell me why you came to your conclusion as well. Type in your replies in the comment box on YouTube. I will reply there as well. Before we wind up today's talk, a few take home points. 25 to 30 percent of NSTEMI actually have totally occluded culprit artery. Occlusion is represented on ECG by more than just ST segment elevation. OMI NOMI paradigm is the next big thing in the world of ECG interpretation. Are you ready for it? And remember, what the mind doesn't know, the eyes don't see. If you found this video useful, then like, share and subscribe to my channel. And don't forget to click on the bell icon so that you do not miss any videos. Thank you so much for listening. Have a nice day.